Hi, this is Geshe Michael Roach. And back to the Nagarjuna sessions, Arya Nagarjuna's teaching uh, called Wisdom, just called Wisdom. And I think the title of the book kind of reflects Nagarjuna's style. Uh, he, he loved to write things short and sweet, uh, very poetic, very, very short, and a little bit mysterious. In fact, uh, we're going to call this series uh, The Mystery of the Chapters. And why we're going to do that is that this first class is a review of where we've gone so far. We've been through three sessions of the Nagarjuna teaching so far. There are going to be five sessions total. And the three that we've gone through, we have covered uh, 17 chapters of the total of 27 chapters. And I don't know if you've been following it. Uh, every time I go back to prepare for the class again, I start to wonder, you know, why are the chapters in this order? You know, first of all, it's kind of unusual to write a book with 27 chapters where some of the chapters might have, I don't know, 20 verses. Remember, it's poetry, right? And then some of the chapters are like two verses or three verses. So that's the first confusing thing. And then uh, people throughout the centuries for 2,000 years, almost 2,000 years, they've struggled with why did he write the chapters in this order, you know? Because it's hard to see uh, what's the connection between the different ideas he's presenting. It's, it's kind of difficult to see any clear progression. Each of the chapters by itself is a beautiful, beautiful teaching. And some of the chapters obviously hang together. There are groups of chapters, two or three chapters, that are obviously meant to go together. But there's no clear flow through the 27 chapters. So Tim Lawenhout and I, we had this idea. Uh, Tony Lama himself, whose commentary we are following, uh, he also struggled, obviously, with this problem. And he kind of cheats when he explains the flow of the chapters. He, uh, he makes up a flow, and then he fits the chapters to the flow. So when he explains the flow, it's out of order. Like the first chapter comes halfway through or something. Like, it's strange. You know, and he doesn't really tell you that. Uh, and he says, here's the logic to Nagarjuna's, the most famous book ever written on emptiness, except for this famous sutras like Heart Sutra or Diamond Cutter Sutra. It is the most famous book ever written on emptiness. And it's not, it's not apparent what's the meaning of the flow. So we decided to have a special challenge for all you guys who are listening to this course. And we we're going to ask you to get into teams of three or four people each. <coughs> I think it'd be cool if the teams were from different countries. Uh, we'll, we'll figure that out when we show you the rules. Uh, you know, but each little team, three or four guys, three or four people, uh, they try to figure out uh, why why is the book presented in this order? And then uh, they present their reasoning or they present their flow suggestion. Uh, each, each team will do it separately. And we'll, we'll sit down and watch all these teams try to explain why. Was Nagarjuna just drunk or was he having ADD? Or is there really a deep, deep reason behind the flow? And normally, with these great, great ancient books, there's a reason why they do anything. There's always a reason in the background. And, and one of the most interesting things in my life is to try to figure out what they were thinking about. You know, what was he thinking about uh, when he put the order in, in, this, uh, in this order? Okay, so it's very, uh, I was, in fact, uh, yesterday I was teaching the Diamond Cutter Sutra, and it's the same question in that sutra. And if you study it carefully, if you look at it for a long time, and you think about it, you meditate on it, 
uh, you can see a flow. You can see a divine flow uh, in, in that sutra. And I challenge you guys to do the same uh, with Nagarjuna's wisdom. We'll have a little contest and we'll ask you guys in teams of three or four to make your presentation about what you think is the order. And I, I really encourage you to meditate on it, okay? And, and maybe that's why he messed up the order is because he wanted us to think about it. And then by accident, we get to think about the book. Uh, maybe that's why he did it. Okay, so by the way, nobody can present that. That's my presentation. <laughs> it's that he, he messed it up on purpose because we would have to think about it. But I, what I'm hoping is that you and me will have to think about the order and we'll meditate on the order. And that's a real meditation on emptiness, okay? So that we'll, we'll tell you more about that challenge as we go along. Uh, this first class is a review uh, we've been through uh, 17 chapters. They're called chapters. What are they really called? But does anybody remember? Yeah, Takpa in Tibetan, or Pariksha in Sanskrit. But what does it mean? Yeah, an examination. Or I, I don't know. I came across this translation. Why well, I, I thought of a translation called it investigation. Uh, so there are 27 investigations of different ideas. Okay. And each one uh, investigates a different question. And this is all so Nagarjuna, you know. He loves uh, investigations. He loves to dig into something and see what's the logic behind something. So really, there are 27 chapters, which are each called an investigation. And I'm going to review with you uh, the, the first 17 investigations. And by the way, I'm going to give you a clue. When you present your idea of the order of the chapters, I, I'll make your life easier, okay? Uh, some of the chapters hang together in clumps, okay? It's kind of hard to sit down and think of the logical flow of 27 different things, but really it's only about 12 or 15 some of the chapters obviously belong together. And I'm going to review those with you today. And so that will cut down the amount of work you have to do. You don't have to look at 27 different connections and see what's the flow. I think you can do it with about 12 or, or 15, okay, different connections uh, between the flow. So I'll, I'll help you with that. Now, uh, when I'm going to review the the chapters, I'm going to use this famous section from the beginning of Choni Lama's commentary. And it's to me, it's a section that I keep coming back to because I keep wondering why did Nagarjuna go to that and why did he go to that? Why did Arya Nagarjuna skip around like that? What, what was his logic? And obviously the question bothered Choni Lama as well. And he gives an answer. Uh, he says, here's the flow, here's the logical flow of the 27, and then he gives it, but he gives it out of order. <laughs> okay. he, he's, he changes the order to make it logical. Okay. He cheats. Okay. So I'm going to do the same thing today. I'm going to cheat and use Choni Lama's order. Okay. I'm going to teach you, I'm going to explain to you what he thinks each chapter is about. And I'm going to take his order and put it back in order. Okay, like he, he does the first chapter after the second and third, like he mixes them up when he explains the logic. I'm going to put them back in order. What we should come out with is a nice review of all the ideas we've had so far out of order. Okay, Choni Lama put out of order. And so I'm not even going to try to explain why. Why does he go to chapter two after chapter one? Why does Nagarjuna go from this topic to this topic? Okay, I'm just going to give you Choni Lama's mini explanation of each chapter by putting Choni Lama out of order. 
Okay, I'm going to present Chone Lama in the Gajanas order. And then it doesn't make any sense anymore. Okay. But at least you'll get a nice review of each chapter. And then it's your problem. It's my challenge to you. And, and it's the kind of challenge as a teacher, those of you, you know, I think most of you will be teachers in your life. And it's the kind of challenge that helps you as a teacher. Uh, it makes the students part of the process. It makes the students part of the team that's trying to figure out the book, you know. And that's the nicest way to do a commentary, okay. Uh, that's the nicest way to have a teaching is to ask your students to help you with a sticky problem. And then uh, the interchange between the teacher and the student teaches the students and teaches the teacher also. And that's just a healthy thing. Okay, and you can learn a lot as a teacher from the students' ideas. Okay, some of the ideas obviously are completely dumb. Just kidding. Uh, but they're all interesting and they're all stimulating, and they stimulate your brains. And you come out. You all come out with a better understanding of the book. And maybe, maybe, I mean, maybe, maybe Nagarjuna wrote the chapters and then put the names in a in a jar and mixed it up and took them out one by one. Maybe, I don't know. Okay, all right, it's possible. Okay, let me start with the title of the book, which to me is exquisite. Uh, the book is called Umatsawe Shirab Ki Namshe Ripe Gyatsar Jupe Tusim. Okay, that's the first line, section one. Umatsawe Shirab Ki Namshe. By the way, these are all my notes and things like that, okay. Um, Thank you for getting that already, Tim. I know you're extremely busy already. Uh, let's go diff through the different words here. Uh, uma, as you know, means middle way, okay, Madhyamaka. And um, basically, if you think about the kitchen example and your husband yelling at you when you get home, suddenly, right? Uh, there's two extremes in the kitchen, okay? One is that he's He's yelling at you because he had a bad day, or he's yelling at you because he's hungry or something like that. Some cause for yelling at you, which is not your fault, okay? So if you believe that the husband is yelling at you for some outside reason that's not connected with you personally, then that's one of the extremes. That's like a ditch on the side of the road. And we don't want to crash our car into a ditch. My, my particular road, I live on a dirt road. Uh, we are not, the, the, the state and the county, they don't pay for my road. We pay for it ourselves. So we have big ditch on either side. It's totally unsafe, okay? And uh, drunk people once in a while, they just fall off. Uh, their car falls off. We don't get sued because it's a private road. We tell people you're not supposed to drive here. And, uh, so think of a ditch on one side is this extreme idea or this extremely wrong idea that the reason your husband is yelling at you is not connected to what you did in the past, okay? That's one extreme. What's the opposite extreme? You guys want to guess? If he's not coming from himself, he doesn't exist at all, okay? And there's a famous uh, comment about the second extreme is that you can't go to the second extreme without a bad explanation of emptiness, okay? So if someone explains emptiness to you and at the end of the explanation, you feel like your husband never existed or doesn't exist, and therefore you have every right to ignore him, uh, you're gonna get into another kind of trouble, okay? So uh, middle way means thread, thread a middle way, you know, thread a middle path between those wrong ideas that the husband's not my fault and that if he's not my fault, he doesn't exist. There's no husband in the kitchen who's not not my fault. Okay, got it? All right, so that's the middle way. Tsawa means root text, mula. And uh, it means uh, the root text or the, the most important basic uh, classic about the subject of emptiness, okay? Uh, and a lot of people include those two words into the title, but they don't belong in the title. They are just a subtitle, okay? So the real title of the book is simply 
shittim, pradsnyan, okay, uh, wisdom. And isn't it like Nagarjuna to name a book wisdom? Okay, and, and try to think of it like that as you learn it, as you go through it. Yes, it is the root text on the middle way, but Nagarjuna wanted you to think of it with elegant simplicity, which seems to be the mark of Samarias, you know, uh, just wisdom. He just calls it wisdom, okay? Shedab ki, namshe means uh, an exp- explanation. Someone's going to give us an explanation of the root text on the middle way called wisdom, wisdom, okay? And that's by Choni Lama. Okay, so this Namshe means uh, a, a, a commentary on the meaning of Nagarjuna. And then comes the, uh, by the way, everything so far in Tibetan is the subtitle. Okay, in English you say main title, colon, subtitle. In Tibetan you say subtitle, colon, main title. Okay, so the real name of the book comes next. Which is Rikpe Gyatsor Jukpe Tru Sing Se. Rikpe Gyatsor Jukpe Tru Sing. Okay, Tru Sing means uh, a boat or a ship. Okay, what's a Namdu for a hundred, not hundred ten dollars? Namke Tru, Namka Tru. An airplane, a ship that goes through the sky. Okay, so true, it's cute, right? By the way, true means uh, a triangular shape, meaning the prow of the boat, okay? So, so true thing, uh, who's keeping track of the money? I don't know. Uh, we'll have Ellie go through the recordings. Okay, okay JB. Uh, yeah, $10 for two. So true thing means uh, a ship. Uh, Jukpa some, is avatara, right, in, in Sanskrit. Uh, uh, I wanted to talk about juke because jukpa normally means to enter or to engage in something. But when you're talking about a journey across a wide space, jukpa takes on a special meaning. And it means like uh, almost a point of entry. Okay? Like what? Portal. Yeah. What's going to be your portal? Okay? What's going to be, what's the port of exit? Is it Los Angeles or is it Guangzhou or, you know, where are you going to, where will you step into the ocean? See, it kind of means that. Where will you set off on your journey across the ocean? It's called Avatara in in Sanskrit, okay? All right. And uh, then he says, to the ocean, Gyatso, Gyatso, okay? And then he calls the ocean Rikpa, which means... It can mean logic, or it can mean reasoning, or it can mean clear thinking, okay? Uh, now, there's a couple of puns going on here. Rigbe uh, Gyatso, the ocean of reasoning, is what Tsongkhapa called his commentary to wisdom. So Tsongkhapa wrote a separate commentary to this book, Wisdom, which he called the ocean of reasoning. Okay, and uh, so really, there's a pun here, or there's a joke here, and uh, Choni Lama's saying, look, uh, so Kappa wrote a book called The Ocean of Reasoning to explain Nagarjuna, but in my opinion, if you try to use just that book, you're going to drown in the ocean of reasoning. It's very funny, and he's like, you need a boat, <laughs> okay, you need my commentary, Tetsokaba's commentary on Nagarjuna, or you're going to have, you know, you're never going to be able to swim to Guangzhou, okay? So you need my ship. And it's kind of cute. He doesn't make a big deal about it. He doesn't mention it. But those in the know, you know he's talking about that. And it is talking about a few other things, okay? What's the other things? Did Avatara strike any chord in you guys? Avatara. There's two famous avatars, Bodhicharya Avatara and Madhyamaka Avatara, which is Chandrakirti's great explanation of Nagarjuna. Okay, so he's also making another pun here, you know. Uh, Chandrakirti Avatara, you, 
And I'm avataring you too. Okay? I'm going to get you into the book. I'm going to get you off on your trip. And jukpa often means, avatara often means to cross the ocean. So there's a specific meaning of avatar. It's a clever use uh, by both Tsongkhapa and Chonin Lama uh, to refer secretly to Chandakirti. Chandakirti's explanation of Nagarjuna is the greatest book ever used for emptiness teachings after India. So after, after India in Tibet, uh, the greatest book ever is, is not considered Nagarjuna necessarily. It's Chandakirti's explanation of Nagarjuna. Ch Chandakirti lived about 350 years later, something like that, okay? Now there's another pun here, okay? Just so you, in case you want to know. And we could do this all day, but we will try to get through the book. Uh, Rikpa, which means logic, okay? Or it means reasoning. But this is not a normal reasoning. This is a, this is a secret reference to Riktsok Truk, uh, the six books of reasoning, okay? The six books of reasoning. Who wrote them? The Garjana, okay? And wisdom is only one of them. Nick just translate, finished translating one of them called the 60 verses. We got the, the String of Precious Jewels, for example, Ratnamala, very, very famous, very popular. Uh, and so we have six great books on reasoning. And that in itself is kokyur, it's not evident. Is it just a book about reasoning? Is it a logic text? Is it a pramana text? And they say, no, it's not. It's tongniki rikpa. Tongniki rikpa. What's that mean? Reasoning for emptiness. You know, reasons to prove emptiness. And that in itself is another uh, reference to a famous teaching by Lord Buddha that says, great students, intelligent students, they want rikpa taye. There's the same word, right? Rikpa taye. Taye means they want infinite explanations of emptiness. A good Buddhist student, a sharp Buddha. In fact, the, the measure of a sharp Buddhist student is one who wants many explanations of emptiness. You know, they're asking, okay, I got that one. I, you know, I understand the one and many argument. I, I got that one. I got the cause argument. Do you have any other arguments for emptiness? So, so truly great students and, and the mark of a Wang Nen, of a sharp student, a highly intelligent student, as far as emptiness, is that they are craving more explanations of emptiness. They're begging uh, for more explanation of emptiness. And, and the kind of student who cannot be satisfied and wants more explanations of emptiness is pretty much the kind of student who's going to see emptiness directly. I mean, it's identified that way. So how do we respond to people who say, oh, this is all too much talk. This is all too much logic. Uh, this is all too much. Well, it's kind of like, <laughs> yeah, that's who you are. <laughs> you know, it's actually an insult uh, to a Buddhist uh, student, disciple, to say they don't want more teachings or they have enough teachings on emptiness, or, you know, they're tired, they, they want to go off and, you know, think about the void. And, uh, and it's considered a, a fault in a student. If, they, if they're not hungry for more kinds of reasons for emptiness, then we would say they need to learn more so that they learn enough to know they haven't learned enough. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And, and that's our lineage. And it didn't start with my teacher. It didn't start in, in Sedona. It started with Nagarjuna. And it started with Lord Buddha. Okay, and they, Lord Buddha, how many sutras and tantras? 990 survive. They say there were tens of thousands, but 990 direct teachings survive and have been input by the ALL Extraordinary Effort to save the ancient books. They saved all 990. They are all input, they're all free online. 
And God bless John Brady and the Asian Legacy Library. So uh, we have to appreciate chances to learn more reasons why things are empty, why things have emptiness. And that brings me to a very great topic is that the Diamond Cutter Press and the Mixed Nuts, which means the crazy translators who belong to the Diamond Cutter Classics Translation Group, they just put out a new book, thanks to the hard work of Venerable Udpala, Venerable Jigme, and Rosa Van Krieken. Uh, they just put out uh, Emptiness Meditations book, a book about emptiness meditations written by Choni Lama again. And it's, how many is it? It's 58 proofs of emptiness. Sorry, 38. 38 proofs of emptiness, okay? 38 different ways to meditate on emptiness. And if you're going to be a sharp student, an intelligent student, you got to get that book. Now, just packing 38 emptiness meditations into a book is a kind of cruelty. If you don't teach people shamatha at the same time, if, if you don't give people the tools to do the meditation on the 38 kinds of emptiness, and you just hit them with the 38 kinds of empty, 38 arguments for emptiness, and you don't give them the tools to develop the meditative concentration that you need to go deep into these emptiness meditations, then I would say that book is not complete. So we had a great inspiration. Uh, Choni Lama inspired us. He said, join this with a shamatha teaching. This is Vipassana. This is emptiness meditations, 38. Join this. Go get yourself a good shamatha teaching and join it to these meditations so that you can reach the meditative state you need to really meditate on these proofs of emptiness, okay? You're going to need another book to study how to meditate on these emptiness teachings. So we had an inspiration. We put, and, and what, who inspired us was Nagarjuna, okay? Nagarjuna wrote a book called The Stages of Meditation, okay? Bhavanakrama, okay? He wrote a book called The Stages of Meditation, The Steps, the Stages of Meditation. And it's an extraordinary, sexy, sweet, extended poem about the connection between emptiness and meditation. Uh, then, uh, about 500 years after him, a great, Buddhist teacher called Kamala Shila. He said, I like this. I like this uh, Nagarjuna poem. You know? It's a great poem, but it needs a little more detail, practical detail. Like, how do you set up your meditation seat? How do you set up your altar? What's the common problems that you're going to bump into if you try to meditate? He, he said, we need something more structured. So he stole the name of Nagarjuna's book, and he wrote a book called Bhavanakrama. And then he had to go to different parts of India to teach it, and he even went to Tibet to teach it also. And he even taught it to Chinese uh, from, from central China. So you kind of got three different versions of Kamala Shila's stages of meditation, the name he stole from Nagarjuna, okay? And those three versions, you can say one for Chinese, uh, ethnic Chinese, ethnic Tibetans, and Indians. And we still have all three. We all three have survived. And we even have the Sanskrit for one of them. So we took Tony Lama's suggestion, and in the Emptiness Meditations book, you can... You have Nagarjuna's stages of meditation translated. And then you have Kamala Shila's first, I think it's the, I believe it's the first, but uh, maybe the third, but one of his three presentations where he stole the name. And it's a very practical guide to meditation. I'm not done yet. Pabonka uh, Rinpoche, uh, 
how many years after Kamala Shila? 12, 12, basically a thousand years after Kamala Shila. Well, no, that's too much. Uh, 1,200, something like that. He, he, he took Kamala Shila's presentation, put it in his Lamrim, following the example of Jetson Kappa, and he made a beautiful practical presentation on how to use Kamala Shila's meditation to, to read Nagarjuna, to meditate on Nagarjuna. So, so we translated that and threw it in the book. And then Pabonka Rinpoche student, Trijar Rinpoche, who was my teacher's teacher, he carved an incredible poster called The Stage of the Meditation. He stole the name from, it's called Kuma Japadatu. The thief coming home at night after stealing the TV set out of the guy's house ran into, it got mugged on the way home. <laughs> the thief, the mugger hit the thief. Okay, Japa uh, Kumalatu. It means, uh, you know, Chinja Rinpoche stole the name that Pabonka stole from Kamala Shila, who stole it from Nagarjuna. Okay, they all use the same name. Why am I telling you that? If you really want to meditate on these emptiness teachings that you're getting, <clears throat> then I suggest you get that book. It's called Emptiness Meditations. It's also by Chonin Lama. <coughs> It has the sweetest teachings on how to meditate, which are too difficult. And you really need someone who has done a lot of meditations. The ideal combination would be a human being who's still alive, who can introduce these steps of meditation to you and guide you uh, through the meditation, how to develop shamatha, and then get to uh, the meaning, the deeper meaning of vipassana or emptiness. Uh, and so we're very fortunate that uh, John Brady, the director of uh, ALL, Asian Legacy Library, and his wife, Connie O'Brady, O'Brien, uh, who's the director of YSI, uh, Yoga Studies Institute, uh, at, our, at the request of people all over the world, uh, they have agreed to write a book of meditation or a, a series of instructions that will become a book about how to do the major emptiness meditations with a big emphasis on the technique for the meditation and following into a, leading into a technique of retreat. So they both finished three-year retreat, the great retreat. So I think it's gonna be very sexy. We got Nagarjuna's book on emptiness wisdom, and then we got uh, Nagarjuna teaching you the steps of meditation. And then we got Kamala Shila making those more practical. And then we got uh, Pabonka making them even more practical. We got Chija Rinpoche making those more practical. And then we got the O'Bradys uh, teaching you how to do it in the modern world. You know, uh, Nagarjuna... Kamala Shila, these guys didn't live in the world of the internet and the airplane and the, and the car, the automobile. And, and we're so lucky that we have John and Connie to, to do that. So I encourage you to you know, follow those meditations and those videos and the book as they come out online. Okay, let's get back to, uh, I can see guest lots. So let's go back to the title. Let's wrap up the title, okay? Uh, a ship for taking off across the ocean of the different explanations of emptiness, uh, which means I'm offering you a ship to cover wisdom, okay? I'm offering you a ship uh, to understand the meaning of this extremely deep uh, ancient book, which is the mother book, Tsawa, uh, Mula. It's the mother book of all emptiness books, okay? So we're, that's the title. You know, we're, being, we're getting an advertisement for the mother book, how to cross the ocean of the mother book of emptiness. And that's what we'll be doing in the next class uh, when we start getting into the different chapters, the topics of the different chapters, and going through those different chapters and finding out 
what's emptiness all about according to Nagarjuna. Okay, we'll see you in the next class. Thank you.